actually, I come to you thinking you need the message more than I do. Today, I think I need the message more than you, so you can just listen along. I'm just like you. I need to be ministered to, and God ministers to me through his word as well. It's a strange thing to say because somebody back there in the past uttered those same words, and when he said them, I thought, hmm, that's strange, you know? (laughs) But here we are, fast forward to this time, and I need them today probably as much as you do. Um, So, the person we're looking at is David. Uh, We know that David was king at the young age, just a young man. He's anointed king. And all of these vignettes of his life are background for something. You know, there's a lot we can reach into David's life and say, I see it. Anointed king, He's the youngest of his brothers, which, technically speaking, would cause a lot of family animosity. Anybody know anything about family animosity anywhere? (laughs) Yeah. So you've got that frame to deal with. And this young man, anointed king, and at the moment he was anointed king in heaven. You remember we spoke one time of those heavenly transactions? In heaven, that was recorded. Whether he became king immediately and reigned, or whether it was over the course of time, God recorded that act. He became king. The interesting thing about this book and the life of David, it helps me understand that great passage quoted here so often. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. What God has declared in heaven, we as wrestling, struggling saints reach up and we grab hold of those words of promise that contradict our circumstance. That's why I love David so much. Even though the circumstance says, "Uh uh-uh, God's word says, "Uh uh-huh, and you grab hold of that word. And this is why when we really begin to understand this book as a whole tapestry, not just individual parts, when Jesus taught the disciples to pray and he said, our Father, when you pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. For us on earth, reaching up by God's promise to appropriate to ourselves, regardless of what is going on in the seen realm. When God said it, that's our flag post. It's like putting a flag on the moon. That's like God's word. It's up there. Don't try to tear it down. Regardless of what's going on, you appropriate that to yourself, and you walk as though in that moment you've reached up time and eternity at a crossroad meet, and the consequences belong to God once you've reached up in faith. David tells me that same thing. His life and the way he worshiped God Man, I relate to the fact that here's a young man who is now anointed king, inexperienced, hmm, too young probably for most folks. Well, you know, he's he's just a kid. What does he know? How can he lead? But when God is doing the anointing, the leading, and the calling, God can take anything. Lessons from David's life include the fact that when he went to face the giant Goliath, And a lot of people, I'll tell you this, folks, what really kind of irks me as a teacher and as a pastor is folks who read the Bible and they read it like it's a story. And they never take the words on the paper and say, wait a minute, this is not some good Sunday school story. This is something that God, he favored us to put it on paper so that we could see. No, we haven't. I don't know about you. I've not slayed any giants with a stone and a sling and have not reached into the giant's uh, pouch there to get his sword and chop off his head. But the image is when we take the stand of faith, we become David's and our Goliaths, those impossible gargantuan things that stand in our way can be cut down like the scripture says out of Isaiah, those mountains, those high mountains will become low. God does that. God can do all of that. So the lesson of David, a young boy, in fact, that image of Saul trying to put his armor on him is what we spend most of our time doing, trying to fight our battles in the flesh, 
Give me some weaponry I can feel. Don't let me have to fight this good fight of faith. You mean with my hands tied behind my back while God is supposed to do my fighting for me? Yep. Try that on for size. You go out there and kill that giant with five stones and a sling. I'll be back. <laughs> but David is a source, as I said, of encouragement. And we encounter all of these different vignettes of his personality that I put flesh and blood on. It speaks to me. I see him fleeing from Saul, but I also see Saul's son, Jonathan, who befriends and becomes very dear to David. Do you know what that's like? Because we've all had these experiences. We read this kind of as an arm's length experience, but we've all had that experience in our life where we become friends with someone that somebody else dislikes, and all the murmuring takes place. In David's case, we really see a man after God's own heart. We see a man who, if, if related to on biblical God principles... Most of the time, he walks on this plane that none of us will ever attain to, but a lot of the times, he's right down here where we live. Guilt and shame in his folly regarding Bathsheba. You know, as I said, a lot of folks want to read the Bible, and they say, yeah, but come on, he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then killed the husband and had the kid and let's embellish the story some. But... That's very much a part of today's society. People just don't respect other people's person or their being, and they can rationalize in their mind, rationalize their behavior, which, by the way, forgive me, but that type of rationalizing will take you to hell. This is why David doesn't only give us the example of, of a man making mistakes, but he gives us an example of what a good man or woman, but I'm going to use the man term generically, of what a good man will do when he faces his evil. He pens Psalm 51, and he didn't start his psalm of repentance by trying to make excuses and cover-ups and painting his black gray. You know what, friends? As a pastor, that's the hardest thing I have to deal with is when people are busted in their sins and busted in their mess-ups, I'm the first person to say, forgive and let's move on, but I'm not going to forgive someone until they come to the reality that their sin, their mistake, drives a wedge between them and God and the fellowship between man and man or man and woman. Don't try and paint it over and then get along with me. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And the answer is no. So, wow, just tell me more about David, Pastor, because I'm seeing the fire in your eyes. Well, let me just refresh a few of the things I've said. Because if we reach into this book today, taking note of the steps of David's life, his high points and his very low points, we encounter in David's life these great lessons. As we move through his life, we see now he's on the run. He is fleeing for his life. And I cannot imagine, I just can't, I've tried in several different dimensions to try and put this together. A man who knows he's anointed to be king, a man who knows he will have a kingdom, and yet he's fleeing like an animal being pursued. There's one of these passages out of 1 Samuel where David and his band are on one side of the mountain and Saul's on the other side, and they're virtually, they're on each side of the mountain. Saul knows he's pursuing David, and Saul is called away because the Philistines are sacking the camp, so he turns away, but there was just a little divider between the two. And I'm imagining like God because I always look at the Bible from my perspective, my application, then I try to get a bird's eye view like God looking down. God saw right where David was, right where Saul was in this pursuit. And who do you think orchestrates the Philistines sacking the camp back there to call off the dogs pursuing David? God was in control. That's the other lesson that's just so equally tough for some of us to come to finally. God's in control no matter what it looks like. God's in control. Now, I take us to 1 Samuel 21, 
And this is where we'll start a little bit of the tapestry. As I said, I'm going to take you to the Psalms afterwards because the whole point of this is to show you that offering sacrifice of praise is not when you feel like it. Offering the sacrifice of praise, as, as David is going to show us, will be at seemingly the worst times. It's 1 Samuel 21. I've given you a little tapestry, the background to this. Now David is fleeing for his life. He comes to Nob, or Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? There's a good lesson right there. The priest had the sense to ask him, Why are you alone? Why is nobody with you? David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee. And for the visitors here, I'm reading the King James Version, if it sounds old. That's the version we're reading from. And what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. And now, therefore, what's under your hand? Give me five loaves of bread. He's asking for bread. He's begging for bread of the priest. And the priest is going to tell him, hey, whoa, there's no bread here except for that hollowed, sacred bread. I want you to catch the picture. Just in this one moment where he's begging for bread, anointed king, obviously we know Saul is still king, reigning, but here's the man who will have a kingdom and he's begging for bread. Came out of that house of Jesse. We know that they had, they weren't poor people. Can you imagine gaining stature of being told, you're king now, or you will be future king, and you're begging for bread. There's another lesson right here. Some of us, as children of the king, have failed to realize we are his children. Just like David, not seeing yet the king reigning, but in type, we're just the same. And we spend a lot of our time going back to beggarly elements rather than saying, I'm a child of the king, getting to sit at the king's table, honor and privilege. He's begging for bread. The priest says to him, there's no bread here except for the hallowed bread. And the priest says, if you've kept yourself from women three days, King James has a real fancy way of saying this, and the vessels of the young men are holy, You can have the bread. All right, the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread, which was taken from before the Lord, and, of course, that bread which was replaced by fresher bread. And then, of course, David asks, is there a spear or a sword here? Is there any weapons here? Again, I want you to catch the picture of this. The only sword that is there in that area is a sword that's in a corner wrapped in a a sheet, which is the sword that belonged to Goliath that David once held in his hand to cut off the head of the giant. And I want you to freeze frame this thought right here and ask yourself the question, what for David must have been extremely bittersweet because it had to call to his mind somewhere back there of the great victories that God had won for him. You ever been there? Because I've been there. There's something that triggers in your mind a great victory. God won for you back there. But right now, you're in a new crisis with a new dilemma, with new soreness of heart and new pain, and you can't really grab your mind around the fact that maybe that was the last victory God's won for you. Those were the good old days. Anybody know what that's like? Those were the good old days. Maybe, in fact, and I speak to you as somebody who has had a little bit of experience in this. The sensitive soul in those dark times where you say, maybe maybe I've pushed the margin one time too many. Maybe God's taken his presence from me. You ever said that? You ever uttered that? 
That's a sensitive soul. By the way, if you've ever asked that question and uttered those words, you can be sure of one thing. God is there comforting you because you're still inquiring about him. He hasn't left you. Because you're still in that sensitive mode that says, have I told the line with God? It says you still have that humble, healthy, fearful respect that God is God. He's still on his throne. And for the dark night of the soul, he is there comforting Just remember that when you start asking those questions. But back to David. It must have triggered something in his mind. Oh, those sweet victories that I had. Those good old days. Nobody hated me. I was Jesse's boy. Nobody hated me. I was part of a good family. I just tended the sheep. I wasn't fleeing for my life. People weren't out to hurt me. I had plenty of bread on my table. I remember those days. The mind can play tricks on you a little bit in those moments. Of course, you know, Ahimelech gives him that sword, and he's gone. He takes off, and he flees again. This time, fleeing for Saul, he goes before Achish, the king of Gath. That would be in verse 10 of that same chapter 21 of 1 Samuel. Another strange oddity, fleeing to that one place where he encountered the priest, at home yet not at home with the priest. Now, in the enemy camp, king of Gath, that's where Goliath's hometown champion that he slayed, the king is there. He's going to the king. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. Again, a flashback which must have staggered David. And I'm asking you to put flesh and blood on this because there's bound to be times in our lives where we think we have had so much favor with God. We'll flash back to those moments when we, we felt... If it was just in our heart, God was holding my hand. He was leading me. I wasn't alone. Now David is afraid. He changed his behavior before them, feigned himself mad in their hands. You'd see him standing there, David, with spit. It says, going down his beard, acting. He feigned himself. It says, a madman, a crazy man. The king says, hey, i got enough insane people in my kingdom. You need to bring me one from outside? Get rid of this guy. What's the matter with you? And then chapter 22, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dullam. We just keep going down the line. And I'm asking you as I paint these vignettes to just keep in your mind that ultimately I'm going to take you to an understanding of what the sacrifice of praise is. You and I have many things in common with David. We may not be, right now, we're not being pursued by people with spears and swords running through desert lands. But you know what it is that keeps running after your soul. For some of us who are fighting the good fight of faith, some of us who are walking and trying to walk, sometimes I think people are very glib when it comes to Christianity. They think, oh, it's easy not for someone who's fighting addiction, not for someone who's fighting for the fight of their life with disease in their body. Christianity is a thinking person's religion, and it is the faith, and the faith alone, that God said something forever, O Lord, thy word settled in heaven, that reaches up to grab hold when the moments at Nob, when the moments at Achish, before Achish, when the moments in the cave of Dullam. Please don't tell me, otherwise I'll feel like I'm the only one here. You ever had a moment where you just want to crawl back in bed and lift the blankets and sheets over your head, close the lights, and just go to sleep? You ever had that happen, or I'm the only person here? Okay, there's a couple of honest ones here, because guess what? I know that's true for every single soul. We've all had those moments in our life. And that's what's interesting about this. David could have in these moments of fleeing, he could have 
entered into pity for his soul. He could have entered into excuse-making and rationalizing. He could have entered into a season of bitterness. God's forsaken me. God's not answering my prayers. God's not taking care of my enemies. Instead, he escapes to the cave of Dullam. It says where his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down to him. And I like this because misery loves company. Everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, 400 men. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab. He said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. This is the voice of a man after God's own heart asking and saying this declaration, you keep my mother and my father, king of Moab, until I know what the Lord's going to do for me, which is better than most of us, because most of us just say, oh, God's not doing anything, and I'm in a panic now. It's really hard to stand still and say, till I know, but here's a man who we know his great victories, and he still had the humanness just like us to say, till I know what God will do for me. He brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt, his folks dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. David departed, came into the forest of Hereth. Now, I'd like to point out something. It's kind of interesting. In Hebrew, names mean certain things. We read Judah, and we fail to recognize that when David went into the wilderness of Judah, that very rocky and kind of barren, hot land, Judah also means praise. And that's what's interesting. You know, I'm sure that as the, as the picture is kind of unfolded, it seems almost contradictory to be in the wilderness of praise. A Hebrew would have known the word we read, J, Judah, but Yehuda and all of the Yada words for praise, being sent into the wilderness of praise. And I thought, I just thought, you know, that would be a perfect message right there. Because we spend most of our life, this life, in the wilderness way, wandering and trying to find our way, looking for water and looking for rest. And while we're in the wilderness, we also have to remember that praise to Him is important. Just because it doesn't look good doesn't mean you can't be offering up what belongs to Him. We were created to worship Him. We sometimes forget that because we let our needs overtake us and start running the show of our life rather than God getting what he deserves. And we don't praise and worship him for what he does. We praise him for who he is, his power, his omnipotence, his ability to know, which he knows, when I'm in these experiences, when you're in those dark times. So I said to you, I need this maybe more than you today. I had the experience through the week of navigating through different experiences with different people. And rather than getting myself into a place where I introspected and looked at the events of the week as failure, I began to see God was doing something really good for me, something really big that I'm looking back now and saying, wow, Lord, if this is the type of lesson I need, I accept it. I'll be brief and tell you as a sidebar before I take you into David's praise. I began to praise God in my situation. I felt the sting this week of what I was describing to somebody earlier as ink on my soul. You know, you can, as a Christian, believe in this word, walk in this word, Say, God said it, and that's that. But you can't connect with somebody who does not live in this book if you're trying to connect with someone on a Christian level. Please, men and women who are in the sanctuary at the sound of my voice, please don't say to me, I'm a Christian, if you're not feeding your soul on his word because it is that which makes you Christ-like. You feed on this as your source. A man or woman who comes to church and only opens their Bible on Sunday, 
I'm a little bit scared because this is our sustenance for the week. The world functions on a different principle. Mine is, I must feed on this. In other, in other words, to walk with God and his ways, I need to know about his ways, and I find out his ways through his word. No matter what state I'm in, I hear a little bit of Apostle Paul speaking right now. I've learned to be content right through this word. Forever, O Lord, thy word settled in heaven. So as I went through my experiences, I described to somebody what I called ink on my soul. Have you ever had a pen break or bust open on a white cotton shirt or tablecloth? You know what happens? It's there. It's just there. And I think I had a little bit of that happen to me in the events of the week where I felt like ink had been dumped on my soul almost in a repeated nature, to where rather than crying out and saying, God, why would you let this happen? I began to praise God and give him thanks that he would teach me a lesson so powerful. And that's really the point of Bible teaching and preaching, that God will teach us these lessons, that we take them to ourselves. Otherwise, we're always hearing these words and we're never appropriating them, putting them into practice and making them part of our fiber, part of our nature. What good is preaching? What good is studying this word if we're not taking these and applying them? It's like women who, you know, ladies, when you buy that wrinkle cream, you know, what good is it applying the wrinkle cream when the product doesn't even work? Except, except you're making the attempt. In this case, most of us don't even reach up and say, I will bless the Lord at all times, not because things are going good, but because things are going bad. And God, I know you're in control. I know you love me, and I know you see my tears. The scripture says you take them and you put them in a bottle. It's recorded in heaven each time a child of God has sorrow and has hurt. Our Heavenly Father knows and knows His children. So that, let me take a little foray into Psalm 63. And why? Because the heading of Psalm 63 says a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And I really want you to catch this picture if some of us could learn, and I'm going to speak for me because I'm, I'm telling you, after six years, I think I've only come one other time and said I needed the message more than you. But the lesson for me this week was so powerful that when I went into this word, I said, in the wilderness of Judah, in the wilderness of my world, you put flesh and blood on it for you, but also in the wilderness of praise. O oh God, thou art my God. If you have the capacity to write in your margin somewhere, and I did, I personalized this for me. It's in Hebrew, of course, so Elohim, Elohim, Eli, Elohim. The plural name of God. In the beginning, God created Elohim. That's what starts the book of Genesis. The creative force of the triune God, the majestic God, Eli. Plural, Elohim, Eli. The mighty one, the strong one of me. This little place here in the Hebrew makes it mine. And when I read this, I said... He is my God, and I am his child. He is my God. Whatever you, wherever you are today, this, this may not fit for you, but it's certainly fit for me. Oh, God, thou art my God. No, God, the God who created, the God who spoke, the God who is above all and transcends all, the mighty one of me. He becomes my fortress, my strong place, my high tower, my deliverer, my buckler, my shield. That's the God 
I'm speaking to. That's the God that David wrote of. Early will I seek thee. Literally, earnestly will I seek thee. It's kind of interesting as I pick through this. We have the expression of the sacrifice of worship being depicted right here. He's in the wilderness. He's just begged for bread and a sword. He's being pursued like an animal hunted gone to the cave, having to go to every different place, running all over the place, running and hiding, and yet in the wilderness. Elohim, Elohi, Creator, my God. I wonder how many of us would start off penning a psalm this way if we were psalmists. We'd say, oh, God, are you still my God? Yeah? Yeah. Earnestly will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I want you to take notice of something. He doesn't say, I'm thirsty for water. He doesn't say, I'm thirsty for something else, but I'm thirsty for God. That captured the picture of Psalm 42. That dear going after the water, hunting the water, looking and searching diligently for water. We know where the water is in the New Testament. Jesus said, he's the water. But I want you to catch this picture because David is in a dry place. He's in a place that, for all intents and purposes, he says there is no water there. And from this picture at least put flesh and blood for us that we may be in a place where our needs immediately appear to not be met. Our prayers are unanswered. We're in a place with no water. We've all been to those places with no water in our lifetime. Well, you just go and you go and you go, God, are you going to answer my prayer? God, are you listening? We had many Families in the church, many of you who've called in to the Voice of Faith lines and told me prayers have been answered for something you've been praying for. But how long till the prayer was answered? And in that period, it might have seemed to you like this, the secular world calls it a dry spell. Put this picture right here. He says... I'll earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So I have seen thee in the sanctuary. This isn't a person who had not beheld the glory of God. This isn't a person who's just perpetually on a bad run of luck, bad luck, and always out on the fringes somewhere. This is a person like you and like me. There was a time for you in this sanctuary or in one of the sanctuaries where we've gathered, where you can remember back to a time where you felt like you might have been on a spiritual high cloud. Now there's just sun beating down on your back and no relief. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. Let me just stop for a minute. Here's a man on the run, a man who has to beg bread. I can't think of anything more abasing to a grown man or woman than to have to beg food, and we, we see them all the time here, having to beg for his needs to be met, and he can still say, because I have seen, because thy loving kindness is better than life. What? Is the secret behind this, praising and worshiping God in a dry land? I'll tell you what it is. The loving kindness that David understood was not in the tangible now. It was locked up in what God had already made good on. We walk through life meeting people, and at some point people will come through for us. They'll always be there. You can count on them. 
Magnify that by a million trillion, I'm exaggerating, times, and you'll find that's who God is, always coming through for his children. David understood that because that loving kindness, that Hebrew word chesed, unfailing, unconditional love. God still loved David through his ups and downs. God still loved David while he was fleeing. God still loved David in the wilderness. Thus will I bless thee while I live. That's a little bit mind-boggling. Let me go back to that verse 3 for a second because he says, My lips shall praise thee. That word for praise is the same word being used when it speaks of something that was still rough waters. It is the still, calming, offering up that soothes. You know, the best thing that you can do if your soul is in trouble today is begin to latch on right there that speaking praise to God can soothe your soul. It can calm your soul when you understand, hey, wait a minute. If I'm a child of God, and I know I'm a child of God, God's arms are underneath bottomless, and no matter how low I think I'm falling, he's going to be there to catch me. So I will bless the Lord. I will raise up his name. I will let him know with my mouth. That's one, the fruit of the lips. In fact, Isaiah 57, I think it's verse 19, talks where Isaiah says, speaking for God's mouthpiece, he says, I create the fruit of the lips. You don't come up with how to praise God. When you're in communion and fellowship with God, the mouth opens, and the praise that comes out is because he gave you the ability to talk to him, to commune with him. When the communion is broken, you can't even open your mouth. I know brothers and sisters who are so broken in their communion with God And they go through much of their Christian life, forgive me, faking it. It's all the exterior trappings of what they think praise and worship is, but the real reality is until a person has been, we looked at this through Psalm 51, until a person has been broken, and the scripture says the heart has been circumcised to where what covered the heart up and the ability to open up to God has now, by God, the great physician, he's pulled it back and laid it bare so he's able to penetrate and turn that stony heart into a heart that he's created new and fresh and desiring him. Thus will I bless. Remember that word, Barak, on bended knee, worshiping, speaking good words, God word. So we have a lot of praise going on. We have soothing words from the mouth, We have to bless Barak, thus I will bless thee while I live. That is on bended knee, offering up good words to God. And I love this because David says, I'll bless thee while I live. And that's right, because somewhere else he's going to say, can the dead praise you? David's pretty smart. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Another picture of praise and not some cheap, look at, look at me, folks. I look so spiritual with my hands up in the air. You've seen those. I'm not against that. I've told you, you come in the sanctuary, this is a place to open your heart. But to just go through the motions of trying to create worship, go see a show if you want that. This is a place to get real with God and let God do that, which then, if it's spontaneous and you feel like, during the song service, worshiping with your hands up in the air. I don't don't have any problem with that. Don't look around and try and force somebody else to do it because you're doing it. Everybody else got to do it. (laughs) That's the beauty of worship. It's individual. And in the sanctuary, it's not exploited. Thank God. I'll lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And that kind of sounds a little bit gross. Marrow and fatness... But catch the picture of what David says, and it's really a beautiful image. Those people who would worship 
in those festival sacrifices knew about the fatness and the marrow. That was a celebratory event for the participants. So to be able to liken my soul being satisfied as with, liken to marrow and fatness of a celebration, because I stand here, David is speaking, but I'm speaking as if I was David, being able to offer up praises to you, and that satisfies my soul more than the richest, fattest, grossest food. (laughs) But in that time, it wasn't gross, by the way. Satisfies me more. Oh, to be like David and claim this if your soul is thirsting and longing today, that we can be satisfied with talking to God and giving Him the praise, the soothing words, on bended knee with arms up extended and speaking good words Godward. And my mouth shall praise thee. That's another praise word, another Hebrew word for praise. Halal, with joyful lips. That halal, to be light, to be bright, to boast, to shine, to cause to shine. So you can really get the picture now. How in the world can this man who's on the run, begging for food, being hunted like an animal, living in a cave in the wilderness, and he's offering up praise? Friends, this is why I said to you, the sacrifice of praise is not some cutesy, cutesy little thing that we try and sound spiritual on. It's when the heart has nothing left. When, when you are empty, you will become full. When your soul is at the point of empty, God will come in and fill that. And what comes out will be the praise to him, offered to him, that he then is glorified, not because your mouth sounds spiritual, but it flows out of the belly through the mouth to God, and in your time, whether it's in your bathroom, in your closet, in your kitchen, in your car, it's you talking to God, no matter what's going on, because you've already placed your being on forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And if we are to pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, then by virtue of standing on that promise and offering him the praise, I've already reached up and taken that kingdom that's promised up up there in heaven. I've taken it to earth, planet earth to live with me, and I walk around, and although my eyes do not see it, my spirit and my soul and my faith rest upon that word of promise and my lips and my mouth offer up praise. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, I'd like to ask you, and I'm embarrassed to even say it or want to know, so it's rhetorical, what some of us would do, what some of us do in those dark nights in our wilderness experience. And I think most of us make our bed, the place like a sponge to just take up the tears. Now, an honest soul will tell you, I nearly succumbed to that a couple of times this week, wanting to make the bed the place to just go shed the tears. And man, in my case, if they were to wring out the bed, it could have been a mighty big flood come out. (laughs) See how good an exaggerator I am? Could have been a mighty big flood. They would have had to build an ark. Listen, I believe in keeping it real, so a little exaggeration doesn't hurt once in a while, you know. But what we tend to do in the night seasons, the lament and the sorrow, I can't say what it is for you, but I can certainly know in my heart what it is for me. And meditating on God, meditate on thee in the night watches, Friends, let me just give you one word of advice. If you can't sleep at night because you're so worried about tomorrow's problems and you can't figure out how you're going to get through, take this Bible out. Open up a passage to where you know familiar territory. We have them here. We call them nitro pills. You should know them by heart, but if you don't, take those to yourself on your bed and meditate upon His Word and watch how tomorrow's problems will begin to be reduced down to 
God will give me the strength because as thy day, so shall thy strength be. God will not tempt me beyond what I'm able. No, he'll even give me shoes tough enough for the trip. And yes, I am a blessed person going through a valley. And God said, I'm going to come through. You know the promises. Now, hear the praise of one who knows the promises. On your bed at night, and I would say also parenthetically, that is the time when Satan does his best work. You know that? When you're sleeping on your bed, you'd like to go to bed because you're emotionally wiped out from the day. And Satan, he is the dispenser of toothpicks for the eyeballs. He is the creator of, are there bugs on me or something? He's the creator of, wow, the TV won't shut off somehow. It keeps coming back on. And, or the light won't shut off in that other room. And somehow, sleep does not come to the weary soul. Take out the Bible and begin to meditate on the God. Elohim Eli. I love this. Because thou hast been my help. Well, just hold on a minute here. We got the 26th translation out today. Excitement. And, <laughs> and that verse 7, <clears throat> King James has it in the past, because thou hast been my help. And a few of the translations underneath say, for thou hast become a help unto me. For since thou hast become my helper, that you are my help. It seems like all the translators use different tenses. And I, usually I'm very picky about the tenses. But in this particular case, I said, you know what? We're going to leave it alone. And why are we going to leave it alone? Because you might be in the place to say present tense because you are my help, God. You may be in that moment to say, God, you are, emphasis, you are my help. Some of you may be putting it in the past tense and saying, thou, God, we don't speak thou, thee, and thus, but you have been my help. I know you as my loving Father. You've always been there. You have been my help. And some of us may need to put it in the future and say, God, I know you'll help me. You have never failed me yet. I have it in the present. Because I, when I did this, I actually took the Hebrew, looked at, translated it. It was in the present. And I said, well, by golly, I'm claiming it in the present. You are my help. And I just made a big circle around that. You are my help. No, no man after the flesh. If you need help with your problems, you take them to God. The first mode of operation with God is, will my child come to me? Your parent here, would you prefer your child to come to you first or to go to somebody else with their problems? Hmm? You want your child to come to you first. Well, God wants us to come to him first. And he hears. Because you are my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Literally, will I sing. In the shadow, I just need to be in the shadow of God's wings. You know, there's times when I see the shadows, but I don't think it's God's wings. I just see them. And I say, oh, what was that? You know what I'm talking about. The hardest thing to do is to take these words and apply them, not as a temporary salve, but to take them like a person receives intravenously, that when the time of need comes, you'll not revert back to type, but you'll latch on to that and you'll say, God said it, I'm braced down on this, just like, God forbid, an earthquake. You have a, a plan. Here's my plan for the dark night, and I know he's my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings, I'll sing. You know, that makes me think of Paul and Silas in prison. How could these men be singing songs to God at midnight in that dark, cold, stinky dungeon below ground? But they were. Jeremiah's in prison. He's busy talking about a field in Anathoth. So what about us? 
wherever you are in the dark night, and you may think you're in prison, praising God will bring you to the point of singing his praise. I know my Redeemer lives. I know my God is able. You may be right down there at the real bottom of places. I was there one time. All I could muster up is only believe. I've told you this is a congregation. I couldn't get beyond that. I sung the song, and we still sometimes sing the song, but all I could get to was only believe. I couldn't get to the point in my mind to say, faith, I just had that one dimension. That was what I hung on to. Some of you may be there. Nevertheless, sing to him. My soul followeth hard after thee. Literally, the Hebrew is so beautiful. This word is so incredible. I wish I could paint this large enough for every person to latch on to. My soul clings or cleaves to thee. And I think when we have been stripped of our dignity and when we have been stripped of our joy and all those things are just a memory in the past, at some point you must cling to something, you must cleave to something. Just remember that God is always there. It's us who don't take the first measure to reach and cleave to him, to cling. This word at its root has a loving, clinging, affectionate, pursuing desire to not let go. My soul clings after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Now, we know at the right hand of God, there's power and blessings We also know it says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. So at the right hand of God, all this is being put to me, and I'm in his right hand, and you're in his right hand. Oh, God, help us today to get this picture that if, as I said, I'm preaching to me, if a little bit spills over on you, God bless you and have a good day, but... If this is your state, take it today. And instead of reverting back to the old way, the old way says, oh, here comes the trouble, here comes the pressure, here comes tomorrow, and I don't know how I'm going to make it. God, my God, the mighty God, the strong God, the deliverer God, the healer God, the provider God, the God who says, you may not think that I can, but I've proven myself to the children of Israel, to every successive child of God chronicled in this book as a God who does and who can and who will continue to. I only ask that you and me trust. And in that trusting moment, even when it seems impossible, God's there. I'm asking you today as a congregation, if you're at the point of just your soul is clinging, it's thirsty, you're tired of the battle, you feel the oppressive forces that have finally weighed you down, do one thing. First of all, do two. Don't give up. That's the worst thing you can do. But secondly, start talking to God. Start telling Him and acknowledging to Him You know, the scripture says if we'll commit our way, God goes to work on clearing the road. Most of the time, we don't really commit our way. We say, Lord, here's my problems. Now you take them. And then what you end up doing is you you really, it's like a yo-yo. You put them out towards God, but you got a rope and they automatically come back and you end up taking them back with you. Lord, please cure me. Lord, please heal my heart. Lord, remove this ink stain from my soul. I don't want to walk around with it. Hurt that's created inside the heart for me, and I've come to believe this. You can believe what you want. Anything that is not completely put at the foot of the cross will come between me and God, and I don't want that because that's one relationship that I'm not going to have tampered with, me and God. And I think you can speak for you 
yourselves, in your own situation, that relationship is important to me, so important that I don't want anything to come between it. Now, God, I have this ink stain on my soul. Or whatever it is that you're carrying around today, and instead of beginning to turn it into a pity party, I, I'm telling you where I found myself this week. Lord, thank you for giving me a lesson because I know that God enters into all things to work his good. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for putting up with my hard-headedness. Does that sound familiar to anybody in this room? Praise God. Praise God that there's some here today that know it's real easy to make proclamations with the mouth. And the head may already say, God is going to do, but the emotions may run backwards. I believe, help mine unbelief. I'm asking you as a congregation in this state of mind, offer up the praise and the knowledge that all the ways he's led you thus far, he won't let you down. He's not going to leave you in the wilderness. And while you're in that wilderness state, just remember one thing. It is there that the most tenderest, truest, without hypocrisy, without, is this spiritual enough? When you are in that dry place with nothing to latch on to, the truest worship will come from places in your heart you've never known, you could never create, and something remarkable in the process of praising in the wilderness. Suddenly, a fruitful land is in front of me. The, the sun came up today for Melissa Scott and for some of you. I praise the Lord, and I took that psalm to my soul, Psalm 63, mixed it a little bit with Psalm 34, I'll bless the Lord at all times, and took all of that in combination and said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You said it, so I'm going to hang my being on it. And instead of being so quick to lament going to be a little bit quicker to offer up the sacrifice of praise, just like David did. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.